Nottingham, the Queen of the Midlands, a city bursting with history, tradition, and natural beauty. 60 years ago, like today, the vitality of Nottingham was a compliment to her modest prosperity. Local industries such as Boots, Players and Rally were proving that Nottingham was becoming quite the commercial centre. Life was still challenging from the economic restrictions of the Depression, but her citizens still managed to enjoy the recreational activities and simple pleasures the city had to offer. However, this chapter of pre-war life would eventually come to a close, as the threat of Hitler and war with Germany would soon become a reality. seven when the war started um, so it was exciting for a child of that age and my mother was very upset it came through on the wireless that uh, we were now at war with Germany we didn't actually hear Chamberlain say that we was now at war with Germany because we all laughed and says who's the we <coughs> is, uh, is, is Mr Chamberlain coming with us to uh, help us because uh, we would got no quarrel with the Germans we didn't know any <laughs> Naturally, we were all on tender hooks because we didn't know what was going Because he'd gone through all these other countries and we wondered what was going to happen to us. War was declared on September the 3rd, 1939. And thousands of young British men were drafted into the armed forces to fight for the freedom of the peoples of Europe and Asia. All public uh, performances and even cinemas was cancelled for a short while because of the amount of people that the thought would have been uh, bombed at the time. So a lot of the young male school teachers, particularly if they were just come, uh, students, they were called up immediately. The 18-year-olds went up first, and then probably it would be 18 to 20, 20 to 22, etc. So at first, with all the young men gone, we were left with lady teachers, and they weren't sufficient to teach all the children in the school. So they devised a plan at the Harrow Road schools whereby half the children at that school would go in the morning and the remainder in the afternoon. And one of the teachers, a Miss Cantrell, she had uh, a particular hairstyle where she didn't have a pigtail, it was braided around her head. And all the boys in our class were convinced she was a German spy. We used to go to someone's house for one hour a day, which means about being very academic, I think it suited me. And then eventually, all the old retired school teachers and school mistresses were brought back and then full-time school began. They started off by doing this, um, seeing how long it took us to run home from the school and if it took more than seven minutes, then you'd stay at school if the air raid siren sounded. War precautionary measures were meticulously planned and soon mobilized in the city. This film shows the sandbags placed at the council house in August of 1939. Nottingham's elaborate wartime preparation is often attributed to the pioneering work of Chief Constable Athelstan Popkiss. In March 1939, Popkiss became the city's chief ARP officer. It was often thought that his foresight in organizing an efficient civil defense plan came from a pre-war visit he made with a boxing troupe to Nazi Germany, where he soon became only too aware of Hitler's future territorial intentions. Under his leadership, Nottingham's ARP was considered to be one of the best networks in the country. Looking back, it seemed as if the air raid shelter arrived within days, but I'm sure it took a lot longer to deliver them to everyone. They were built in Anderson shelter as far away from the house as possible, which was embedded into the ground and 
covered with earth, that would have been a, um, a, a safety outlet, providing the bomb didn't hit it direct. Uh, others, the terraced houses in the sort of inner city part, they was provided with communal shelters, who were with a, like a, just like a box. That's all they were. You entered in, and there was just basic benches to sit on. I should think the concrete roof would be probably six to nine inches thick, reinforced, and uh, the shelters were made of double brick with uh, an emergency exit built in. Um, and for the first year or 18 months of the war, we would actually go to bed in the shelter. Um, it's not very nice to have to get up in the middle of the night, uh, especially in the, in the winter. And you must remember there was not centrally heated houses, there wasn't hot and cold water. And to get up, and it was not very pleasant. And um, you only did it out of sort of really, if anything was going to happen. Now the respirator has to be made in different sizes to ensure accurate fitting. Gas masks were issued to every citizen. People were required to carry their gas masks with them at all times in anticipation of an enemy gas attack. Gas, mustard gas, Vernon Road. Warn all street round Vernon Road to take gas precautions. Places of mustard gas. Now speak the inside. Mustard gas, Vernon Road. Large area contaminated. As it happened, such an attack never occurred during the course of the war. But the government were taking no chances. Why, even a little child could wear one. Mary, will you wear one of these for me? Oh, yes, please. Splendid. Let me have your dolly. That's right. Now, let me put it on yourself, will you? That's it. Fine. That's grand. All right. Now, take it off the proper way from the back. That's right, not from the front. Come along. There we are, that's fine. Splendid. All right? May I have one for my darling? <laughs> oh, yes, of course you shall. Rather. <laughs> Blackout conditions in Britain were adopted at the start of the war as a necessary precaution to protect homes and communities from enemy attacks. The reinforcement of blackouts meant a sharp departure from peacetime normality. Because there were no street lights, on cloudy nights, uh, the streets were black. You could walk into people, actually walk into people, uh, because it was so dark. Well, the blackout was terrible because, obviously, uh, in wintertime, we were travelling on trains to Nottingham, uh, and uh, the, uh, it was dark, so we were only allowed one light in the carriage, which was painted blue, which was quite uh, horrible looking, really, and everything outside was dark. There were no lights, nothing to guide you, and all the names of the stations and towns, of course, had been removed because in case uh, uh, they'd got any uh, uh, spies there. And it was all quite dramatic, really. It was exciting when the, you got the news that they'd got number eight batteries in. That was for your torch that you carried round with you. You took a number eight battery, I think. And uh, if Woolworths or Boots or anywhere that had got number eight batteries, you formed a queue to get them. Within the house, I always remember we had to put beige coloured mesh all over the windows in every room. Uh, mother had to put blackout curtains, attach them to the other ones so that they were pulled at night time. You had to have uh, a big curtain over the front and the back door so that if you opened it, you, you could camouflage it to some extent. And we had the ARP walking round and they did call out if you'd let a chink of light through. And you got your blackout, people knocking on your door. No and lights, you, blackouts! You, got you the know, smoke no lights. Oh, them smoke screens on Muddy Lane's a nightmare. Oil. Nightmare. Smoke screens were employed to literally cover the city in a cloud of smoke. But, but, but it created this terrible smell and fog. And, oh. and of course, where I worked in engineering at Lenton, I had to be there for six o'clock in the morning, and these beastly things would be still, you know, very pungent. And these are made of big oil drums 
with chimneys and a little sort of hat on the top. Yeah. The, the yeah. Now, the was the background was a long thing with thingy on top, wasn't it? And when the wind was blowing over Nottingham from this side, the army would come just as it got dusk and they would light all these um, smoke screens and you'd get this black smoke puthering out which you hoped would go over there. Bashing in German, remember what, uh, Joe Webster, he stood and fought one. He was that drunk, he stood and fought one going in navigation yeah. pub. I'll hit you, says I'll back you. Along with the threat of enemy air raids, there was also the threat of enemy infiltration into national security. As described by Inspector William Wigg, communications officer with the Nottingham Police Force during the war. We'd get a report that a certain doctor was of German origins and we got some mysterious wires coming down from the bedroom down to the, in the back garden. And when it came to, it was his youngsters up flying aircraft there, model aircraft down the wires. <laughs> we had lots of inquiries about different people in there, uh, but we never found anything that, was, that warranted being arrested or anything like that. Air raid warning. They are paid personnel should report to their centres without delay. Civilians needed to be told that they weren't to risk their own lives unless their their property was imminent and they could deal with it. And they were they were having to be taught both by the air raid wardens who were taught by the fire service how to deal with the incendiary bombs by using sand and how to use a stirrup pump. Civilians were encouraged to join various civil defence groups. The auxiliary fire service was established to give support to the existing fire brigade, who despite having considerable high standards of training and up-to-date equipment, could not be expected to cope with wartime emergency conditions. Approximately 45 auxiliary fire service stations and depots, manned by 1,046 men, were operational within the city limits. From the police point of view, we, we had to do our stint of uh fire watching in case of bombs and uh, we we took it in turns uh, in fire watching and uh, we used to <laughs> we used to lie, lie on camp beds at night wait for in case of uh, any bombs or anything like that and uh, we used to get three and six puts a night and uh, I was very very light sleeper in those days and I could never sleep. So I used to spend the three and six months on two pints of beer. And uh, that enabled me to sleep. First aid posts were also set up. There was one first aid post to approximately every 15,000 people throughout the Nottingham area. The Red Cross joined with the Order of St John to form the Red Cross and St John's War Organisation. They established six auxiliary hospitals in the county, as well as creating the Central Hospital Supply Service, which involved members knitting and mending comforts for hospital patients and prisoners of war. And they asked me if I would walk round the streets with the air raid wardens if there was an air raid. And instead of going into the shelter with the rest of them, I walked around the streets with the wardens. I went down to Eastcroft to sign up for Red Cross course, hoping to be, become a useful member of the Red Cross. We did a, a rush first aid and a nursing course to get trained as quickly as possible. And we uh, did two nights a week nursing for six weeks and then an exam and then two nights a week first aid, and then another exam. And then we were considered ready to go into hospital. And I went to the city hospital every Friday night until I'd completed my 50 hours. I found this Royal Marine badly injured. 
Um, don't know whether it had been caught up in an air raid or what happened, but I was coming back from a wedding when the sirens went. And of course I stopped and I said to, I was with my mum and dad and I said, definitely something wrong with him. I could tell with his breathing. So I went over and I could see the state he was in. So my underskirt came up <laughs> and was wrapped around his head. And I thought, now what am I going to do? The sirens have gone. And I saw somebody coming down the street in a car, so I whipped out in the road, I stopped his car, and I said, I want you to take this man to the hospital. All this wonderful work to reduce human suffering can be done by you, by you, and by you. But I did wanted to do voluntary work as well, so I joined the WBS. The Women's Voluntary Service recruited volunteers from all women's civil defence services. We did so many varied things, really, with that. We used to go to the um, council house, I think it was most Friday afternoons, and pack uh, parcels for the forces. People contributed various things, and of course the firms did, John Player. Most of the firms locally sent things. The Nottingham Services Comforts Fund was the largest of its kind in the country. It sent comforts to over 125,000 serving men and women. Between five and six million comfort parcels and other gifts were dispatched. They had a forces canteen on the Victoria Station in Nottingham. Uh, that was good because we had forces, um, we had the big troop trains come through. We had to mash the tea. We used to take it, well, the porters took it down in buckets, the tea, and onto the platform. The canteen was upstairs, you see, and then we served the troops on the train. There'd probably be between four and 500 troops on the train, so it had to be done quickly. And it was all, you didn't know, well, we knew that they were coming in, but nobody, we weren't allowed to tell anybody that this troop train was coming through. And we served the tea in jam jars, because we'd got nothing else. Uh, you couldn't get China, well, you couldn't get cups of any description, really. You couldn't get much at all. So we served them these sandwiches. Fortunately, sliced bread had just come in. It was usually dried egg sandwiches with anything crust or anything we could find to put in, and slabs of cake, fruit cake, which I remember some of them were sort of bright yellow. But anyway, they enjoyed it, and the lads did. This amateur demonstration film, shot in Colic Park, clearly shows how civilians were trained to remove injured parties from a bomb site. The mock injuries inflicted on these civilians were to demonstrate that injuries can vary in size and severity and how they should be treated. The graphic depiction of scars and wounds is one that is still used today in training for air disasters. Civilians were also trained to enrol the support of local civil defence forces in the transportation of injured persons to rest centres and shelters. In order to put the civil in civil defence, refreshments were laid on after the exercise for rescuers and rescuees alike. On the 14th of May, 1940, Sir Anthony Eden, then Secretary of State for War, broadcast an appeal for men between the ages of 17 and 65 to form a new force whose primary function will be to guard factories, railways, canals, and other vital points. Initially, 
the new force was called the Local Defence Volunteers and then became known as the Home Guard. My father, who was a textile designer and a local artist, said this was the nearest he could explain what it felt like when he first learned to shoot with the Home Guard. There were five Home Guard battalions set up in Nottingham. One was confined to the factory units and the other four had detachments covering eight districts. Father would be with the Home Guard around Hillside and Triumph Road, it was all a field then with a hedge. And I can't remember whether it was another platoon, I presume it was of Home Guard, who were the enemy on this particular day. So Father used to get me to cycle round the boulevard on my bicycle, and if I could see that the other Home Guard were gathering at Adams Hill, then we would hang on the back of our um, hedge uh, a red towel, and he would look over the wall where, on the other side of the field where the canal was and say, oh, oh, they're at Adams Hill. But if they were a bit further along, then I would put, a, say, a blue towel. The Home Guard would be in this trench um, behind the hedge with bags full of flour, and then they'd come along in their jeep or whatever and lobby. Oh, it was wonderful to watch. I mean, it was very like Dad's army. <laughs> The youth of Nottingham were also eager to participate and provide their services for the war effort. Young people were encouraged to join various youth organisations, such as the Nottingham Boy Scouts, Civil Defence Cadets, Boys Brigade, Girls Training Corps, the Nottingham Girl Guides and the Army, Marine and Air Cadet Corps. Air Defence Cadet Corps was initi initiated by the Air League of the British Empire. Cyril Ball along with some business associates, formed the 138th Air Defence Cadet Corps. Squadron leader Ball, a First World War fighter pilot and the brother of Albert Ball VC, was also an accomplished amateur filmmaker who was responsible for this colour footage. Well, aeroplane mad, as most lads were about that age, and uh, their great ambition was to become a pilot in the Royal Air Force. That, that was really it. Originally, there was no uniforms. They went quite a while without uniforms. And there was that big an influx of cadets or young lads into the cadet force. They had to form a 139 squadron. And I believe the 209 squadron was down at Trent Lane as well. Uh, training twice a week, Saturdays, Sundays. Uh, attendance, anything from 80% onwards. And it shows the amount of interest that young people in those days found in joining the air cadets. War was expected, and of course we all wanted to go into the Air Force. We had two aeroplanes down there, didn't we? The Bristol Bulldog and uh, the Tiger Moth. But airframe fitting and repairs on this Tiger Moth, they were all carried out under instructors who knew what they were doing. And Anybody who were interested in sport, boxing, physical training, etc., used to go down on Thursdays. Uh, it developed from Thursday to Tuesday and Thursday. Yes, it? Yeah. Uh, we used to uh, do a lot of running around the race course, faster than some of the horses go, actually. Uh, and then we used to uh, go back, punch ball, we had a punch ball, a ring, a skipping ropes, punch bag. I had quite a good team. Friends, they, oh, were, they yes. were super lads, super. Yeah. We it were, was marvellous. Yeah, there was, was never any trouble and everyone Good comradeship, that's what it was all well, about. everyone then was purely a volunteer, wanted to be there. I well think, prepared. I think the beauty of that, it not only prepared us for the forces, but it prepared us for our later life. In 1941, conscription for women was introduced, whereby the available pool of female labour could be channelled into areas of the war effort where they were most needed. 
many women filled traditionally male-dominated occupations, such as postal workers, bakers and bus drivers. Big businesses continued to make strides during the war. Boots' manufacturing capacity was vital to the war effort. Measures were taken to protect the D-10 factory at Beeston against damage. Where possible, all glass was removed and replaced with fireboard, and the exterior was painted in camouflage colours. Boots also contributed to the Dig for Victory campaign, aimed at the greater production of food. Some 40 acres of land around the Beeston factories were planted with vegetables. Raleigh demonstrated their complete overhaul of production during the war in their film, Thus We Served. This huge plant was placed at the nation's disposal as it had been in the last war. The wheels of the war machine began to turn rapidly. From this period, the Raleigh works never closed, working all day and all night, seven days a week, Vast quantities of war material began to come off the machines. The Raleigh Company was singled out to become the largest fuse manufacturers in the country, turning out no less than 150,000 fuses of various types per week. The basic production was the 119 percussion fuse, comprising 30 separate and distinct parts. Vast quantities of these percussion and time fuses were used by the artillery of the 8th Army in their victorious North African campaign and later in all other theatres of war. Another great undertaking of the Raleigh factory was the manufacture of 20mm cartridge cases, shells and fuses for the famous Hispano and Ehrlichen guns. The Hispano gun was the main armament of the Spitfire and other fighter aircraft. No less than two and a quarter million rounds of this ammunition were produced each week at the Raleigh works, making this factory the largest industrial manufacturer of fuses and 20mm ammunition in the country. The Battle of Britain saw the Hun shot from the sky. Raleigh workers were proud to be some of the many who helped the few. Bicycles for commandos, an urgent necessity. Here is where Raleigh was on top of its fall. A little bit hush hush, I think, because I was just taken off uh, doing one particular job. Uh, and uh, next thing I knew, I was uh, uh, tapping the bottom brackets out. They soon produced a wizard folding machine that could be assembled in 30 seconds. The commandos used these wherever commandos went, and they went to plenty of places. He wasn't told nothing. As far as I know, there was uh, folded up and put on the uh, parachutes back and so they could use them when they uh, parachuted it into. France or Holland. Big corporations like Raleigh had their own home guard, air raid wardens and shelters, fire watchers, hospital and canteen facilities. The lunch interval was a welcome break in the day's toil, as welcome as the entertainment provided by the Raleigh Works Wonders Band throughout the war years. Even foremen have to eat, though some people don't see why. Blimey, tablecloths. Local businesses, large and small, encouraged their employees to donate money from their pay packets to the war savings campaign. In three and a half years, Nottingham subscribed more than 18 million pounds to the campaign. Transport in the city became scarce and infrequent during the war. Nottingham City Transport lost four buses to the air raid precaution in 1939 and another six in 1940. Bus times were very irregular due to the blackouts and rationing. Most buses stopped running by 10 p.m. every night. All headlights were to be masked with white painted mug guards and bumpers and the lights were a nighttime blue. Buses were parked away from their garages overnight and at weekends to avoid major losses during air raids. One dispersal point was the forest recreation ground, where a system was devised to plug buses into electrical supplies to keep radiators warm in order to ease morning starting. Fuel rationing, beginning in October 1939, meant that many services had to be withdrawn. Barton Buses was the first company to introduce a bus that ran on gas. Rationing, of course 
also became a part of everyday life from 1940. You couldn't go out and buy all the food and the sweets and the, everything became started to get shorter and shorter in supply. Everywhere. It was always co-op and the butchers and... You couldn't get eggs or fish or anything like that. Uh, not unless uh, somebody got some black market where, you know, you can pay a bit extra to go and get a couple of eggs, fresh eggs, like, you, you know. Chicken in alcohol, that's where I knowing. I remember queuing with my mother and not knowing what was being given out at the other end. So the ladies saw a queue of people, they would join it and probably say to the person in front of them, what are we queuing for? And she would probably say, well, I don't know. But it was obviously something that was in short supply and this particular shop had a quantity of it. Oh, we had dried eggs, that's mm. right. Powdered egg, powdered egg. She'd spoon, I think, a couple of spoons into a dish and then mix it with a bit of water and put a drop of milk in and salt and pepper went in. And then it was in the, uh, in the saucepan, presumably not with any fat, because you couldn't spare fat to put in the bottom. Just stir that out. It tasted pretty cardboardy. On several occasions, my grandmother would say to me, have you brought your rations with you? <laughs> because if we were staying for a sandwich, which of course she would give us, she would wipe on the butter and almost take it off again. <laughs> that's that's how it was. Mother had to make uh, a meal out of anything, and if they could get anything off ration and things like that, uh, they did it. And uh, perhaps uh, a few rabbits and things like that, you know, make a good old stew. Because my grandfather had got uh, an allotment, so he used to grow quite a bit of the food. Thousands of ordinary citizens also participated willingly in the general effort to produce food, however and wherever they could. My father decided that it was more important to, uh, to keep the back garden for uh, potatoes rather than shelters. We had two chicken runs and, uh, and, and later, to, to, to getting towards the end of the war, my father even kept pigs. So at least we had uh, fresh eggs, which was uh, denied to a lot of uh, people. Although the chickens weren't killed, as it were, they more or less had to die of old age uh, before they arrived in the pot. And as for people wanting to get married and, and organising a wedding cake and things like that, it was impossible. You couldn't do that unless you had a lot of family who were prepared to give up their butter and sugar and all the other things that go into a cake in order to produce it for you. And I understand that some of them did that. Because an awful lot of young, young soldiers, young people, uh, probably the soldier was going to go abroad, had a, a tendency to want to get married. And my husband hadn't been called up then, but it was in May 1940 that we were married. So I was lucky because Quite a few people contributed clothing, you know, points to me. And my sister was very, very good at dressmaking. So she made all the dresses, mine, the bridesmaids, and my mother's dress. She made all those. So that saved us quite a few. And of course, food. I mean, the reception, we only had a little one at home. We lived at Bobber's Mill. It's only a small house, two up and two down. But the reception, <laughs> such as it was, was there. Radio was very limited. There's only the, I think it was the home service. No television, of course. Entertainment was very, very home, do-it-yourself things. And the cinemas was a, a Monday, usually Monday to Wednesday, and then Thursday to Saturday, and the Sunday night. So you got three changes of programmes, and a load of cinemas to pick from. And it was quite a place to go to. It, it was an escape route for us all, really. Uh, my husband, he was fond of the, the cinema as well, and he'd write and tell me what films he'd seen, and I'd write and tell him what films I'd seen. It was just one of those things that kept us together, really. Well, we used to go to the uh, pictures for, for Tuppence, you know. We used to see uh, Carboy first at the, uh, at the Aspie pictures, that was. And uh, 
and then followed by uh, a serial, Flash Gordon and Ming, and that was a real treat. And I got thrown out once for, for smoking. There was a lot round here. The capital had opened uh, at the bottom here, um, and the grand cinema. Oh, there was a lot, the boulevard. A lot of cinemas all around here and in the town as well. And the pubs, of course, they, they were limited in their hours. And sometimes they would open and they would not have enough beer to go around for the whole session and they'd just close the place down. Or someone would come in and say that another pub, say half a mile away, had, had opened up and the people would just dash off from one pub to another. Due to the fact that we were a free house, my mother was the about and she played off one brewer against another to obtain sufficient supplies. But her real uh, stroke of genius was the matter of Scotch whisky, which was on sale in the pub permanently throughout the war. And this was achieved by the fact that in those days we lived on the Wollaton Hall Drive. And in early 1939, when war was obviously inevitable, my mother had an air raid shelter dug in the garden. But when Nottingham's a big blitz raid came, I'm afraid we couldn't get into it uh, because my mother had filled it with whiskey. When you could hear aircraft going over, my mother would sort of look at me and say, uh, it, it, it's, it's one of ours, it's one of ours. Mm -hmm. But I think now that she may have been trying to convince herself more than she was trying to convince me. Whereas a British plane is boom. A long, steady note like that. So when we heard this, we knew they were German aeroplanes. The f next thing we would hear is, was the moment they came into in range, the anti-aircraft, 3.7 anti-aircraft guns on Beechdale Road would open up. Fire! 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 By this time, we'd given up going in the air raid shelter. We got rather blasé, so I used to get into bed with Mother while Father paraded round in his home guard uniform. And we heard this zzzz noise, and my father got hold of the sheet and yanked it and tipped us with all the bedding onto the floor. And I'm afraid that we were hysterical with laughter, and Father said, you silly bitch, it's a bomb. And we kind of waited for what's going to happen next and nothing seemed to happen and then a little voice from the back bedroom where my grandmother slept said, oh Billy, there's a lovely bonfire in the back garden. One of our regular customers was a pork butcher named Mr Jordan. I never knew what his Christian name was. And he, because he was a pork butcher, he was archetypal pork butcher, fat gent gentleman. And as he stepped out from Long Road across the <laughs> to the bell, down came the message bit, da, 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 <laughs> all the way across. And he leapt back. You see, then he started coming forward again, and he came down the other way, and <laughs> all the way across. Yeah. Well, the poor chap uh, was portly of build, and it was quite quite major on him. He kept jumping backwards and forwards to get the protection of Pearson's opposite. Eventually, the message bit cleared off, and Mr. Jordan came in, and my mother, who had been witnessing this out the office window, came downstairs. And, Gave him a double whiskey on the house for his determination, <laughs> despite enemy activity, to get into the bell. We understand that there was, in the Vale of Beaver, there were decoy fires lit um, in the firm hope that the German bombers would think that that was the city of Nottingham that was uh, bombed and that their, uh, their aircraft before them had made some successful hits and the city of Nottingham was ablaze. And it is said that that decoy uh, of fires in the Vale of Beaver saved the city of Nottingham a tremendous amount of damage. Despite enemy decoys, the Luftwaffe was still able to penetrate Nottingham's formidable civil defense. In 11 attacks on the city, 181 people were killed. Most of the casualties occurred on the night of May the 8th and 9th, 1941. The Nottingham Blitz saw the city experience her worst damage. 159 people were killed and hundreds more injured. A total of 95 enemy aircraft attacked that night. 
I recall being at home in my lodgings and uh, the sirens uh, sounding and I turned out as uh, we were instructed to do. All we did was just cram together, a mother and three children, just huddled, huddled together underneath this table. And uh, it was very frightening when these bombs that you could hear whistling down was getting louder and louder and the sound, as it gets nearer, is very, very terrifying. Nobody bothered to go up when the sirens went until we heard the biggest bang. And when we got to the bottom of the stairs on his hands and knees, all the windows was coming in the back. And then the next one went and that, all the front windows went in from there, from Free Street. This tremendous explosion, four houses on the railway side of Charby Road were completely blown up. The damage opposite, directly opposite, was incredible. I saw it. Front doors were simply taken off the hinges and blown straight up the stairs. I biked down uh, a street called Handel Street, which led to King Edward Street and so on to the fire station on Shakespeare Street, and uh, that was a, a mass of glass. But I got into the station yard and the sergeant in charge said, right, sling your bike in the bike shed, Hodson, get on this fire appliance, and we went to, uh, to Boots, Island Street, Station Street, which was uh, quite a conflagration around there. A stick of bombs actually fell straight in front of the pub. Uh, one landed right outside the front door, in the middle of the road, outside the front door, and immediately a taxi with its way through town plunged down into the first crater. Uh, another the stick continued down the road and blew out one of the pillars of the old Lloyds Bank building. Another one demolished the old Moot Hall. As each one gets louder and louder, you get that feeling, you know, you think, is this going to be my turn? And it was. And as it came, the, I can distinctly remember the sound, the, the terrible sound as it came down. It was a real whining shriek. And then everything just, it's absolute hate. You know, everything goes crazy. No, no colour or anything, just a, a huge explosion, a bang, and silence, and utter darkness. My father took me outside to the front of the house and lifted me onto the garden wall and stood with his arm sort of around my waist, as it were, and we could look straight out over the city and the, the, the sky was aflame from sort of horizon to horizon. The top floors were well alight and we were endeavouring to put this out and we got into the top floor and there was the raking ladder which led up into the roof, into the part where it wasn't on fire, where we could get at that which was. We'd just got to the foot of this uh, set of steps when this senior man said, right, out everybody, he heard creaking. Now knowing he knew what he was about, we all rushed out of the building, down the outside staircase, leaving the hose as it was, and we just got across the yard when the whole of the roof caved in. And so it was a very lucky escape, really. And we were engaged on fires in that area all night. We watched the uh, St John's Church on Canal Street start and finish because there obviously were not enough fire crews to fight these fires. I think we were buried for about five hours, so I would imagine it must have been about four hours when uh, we heard scratchings above us and people saying, anyone there? So, of course, I answered. And then uh, eventually a chink of light appeared, a hand and a voice and a head, and they hauled me out into the, big day, into the morning daylight. I think it was about half past seven. There was a lot of cheering and clapping going on. And uh, it wasn't until later that we learned that the bombs had been dropped and destroyed the cooperative bakery on Meadow Lane. The reason I remember it so dramatically is that my father worked next door at the co-op dairy. The biggest tragedy of the Blitz occurred at the Co-op Bakery at Meadow Lane, where 48 employees and a member of the Home Guard were killed and another 20 were injured.
one of the biggest, apart from the Baker, etc., was that air raid shelter at the bottom of Cotton, Cotton Hill. Mm. That got thumped, and oh, it's horrendous. I did get leave, and I came back, I got off the train at Midland Station, and uh, I walked down the station street to see my old mate or something. When we got down there, he was rubble there, just to, just to see where the building was, with a hole and some bits of wall around it. So that was a shock to me. So eventually I saw somebody poking about the ruins and asking what had happened. They said, oh yes, there was a big raid on Nottingham, and they told me who died. I said, oh dear, oh dear, I said, I, I, I worked with them. The next morning we came down fearful. We knew all this was going off in the middle of the night. We came down next morning fearing we'd lost the pub. And fortunately for us, all the blast went across the road and took out all the windows of Yates and Pearson's and everything else. We weren't touched at the front. But we did get some of the old Moose Hall blown through our bathroom, bathroom ceiling. In all, some 482 high-explosive bombs and hundreds of incendiary bombs landed on the city, destroying 200 houses and making another 250 unfit for habitation. Six rest centres were in operation and they dealt with 1,286 people who'd been bombed out. And of course, the following morning, he left work, came walking round the corner and was confronted by a policeman. He said to him, uh, where are you going, sir? He, he gave him his address and he, he gave him the sad news, you know, that his house had gone and he, he couldn't give him any information about his family. And from there, he had to sort of go and find out. Eventually, he found out that the mother was in the hospital and uh, we'd been sent to this rest centre and cleaned up and uh, we was OK. In March 1944, Nottingham experienced an invasion of another kind. This time, it was the American 508th Parachute Regiment of the 82nd Airborne Division. Over 2,000 paratroopers set up camp in Woolerton Park to prepare for the secret European invasion, which later became known as the Normandy Landings on D-Day. Woolerton Park would later house the Italian and German prisons of war, but it was the Americans who made the biggest impression during their brief stay. We did have quite a lot of fun. I mean, we did have the Americans for a start. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, that's another matter. The Americans were overpaid, oversexed and over here. <laughs> that's quite well, I nearly became an American war <laughs> right? uh, I, I don't think the men folk were very pleased because they'd got more money to spend and they average uh, 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 serviceman, uh, and consequently they, um, they got the attention of the girls while the men were uh, away fighting. And I, I did go cycling, I remember one day, because we wanted to see where it was, and these Americans were standing at the gate and chewing gum. And then this American asked me something and I didn't want, know what it was, so I said, no, thank you very much. And in later years I learnt what he'd asked me, so I was quite... <laughs> I pleased I'd given the right answer. An American had got his girlfriend on the grass and he, he just about obli obliterated her, her body and uh, the dog went and licked her face and a look of sheer bliss went over her face. I think she thought it was the American that was uh, uh, doing the licking. She was rather astounded when she found it was a little dog. <laughs>
he asked me to dance. And they did, all he did was shuffle and he wanted to, his, his, I could feel his hands up and down. I thought, tay up. <laughs> We went direct to Walton Park. We arrived there in the middle of the night and rode trucks and buses out to Walton Park in the, during the blackout. So we had no idea of uh, what the place looked like at that time. Uh, the next morning when we woke up, uh, it was daylight, and we fell out, and there were the king's deer in every direction. And <laughs> and it seemed like uh, World War III three broke out about that time because uh, there was live ammunition showed up and uh, some of the deer were, were killed in the onslaught. Of course, none of us knew at that time that those deer were property of the, of the British government. And they, they dished out quite a lot of uh, goodies at times to people, children, because they were so much better off than we were. The soldiers would come in army trucks. Maybe they were going to collect or deliver what something or other. and. Uh, Occasionally, chewing gum will be thrown out of the back of the trucks. I think that uh, Nottingham was probably the best post that we were ever stationed in. Uh, our housing out there was in Tent City. With, uh, we had six men in a tent with a coke stove in the middle of it. Uh, that wasn't the very best of living arrangements, but the city itself made up for that. We went to the theater, of course, several times and the Palladi dance was there. We went there in the evening and uh, and danced with the local girls. The old horse and groom, which is just a block from the council house, I don't think that is anymore. And uh, the old trip to Jerusalem Inn, it was off limits to our crew many times. And, uh, we were enjoying ourselves anyway. At the end, of course, I'd got to be brought home. So these uh, American officers, oh, we'll take you home, we'll take you home. So they did, about four of them, I think, four or five, in a jeep landed home at about, oh, I think it wasn't terribly late, it was about one o'clock in the morning, something like that. Rolled up here in the blackout. And <clears throat> I come in and quite enjoyed myself, let myself in, went upstairs. My husband had come home on leave unexpectedly. <laughs> he was in bed. And I used to come running up Trowel Road, which was by my place, jogging and, and singing, you know, on the moors. And over in Mart, I was trotting those little, little bit groves of them, the thousands there. And uh, then all of a sudden they've gone. Of the 2,000 men who went to Normandy, only 800 came back. I was standing at the foot of my company commander's grave at the cemetery at Saint Laurent, and. Uh, Somehow or other, I got the idea that I should start a, a reunion, find out how many I could find from the regiment and get them all together again. And uh, they tell me I'm off my rocker, but I still think the idea came from Captain Ruddy, who was my company commander. After Normandy, our, our company commander, our first sergeant, battalion commander, and uh, most of my platoon were all gone. <coughs> I think it would be proper to be all and salute. Two. The night that the war ended, the whole edge of the road, uh, people put candles because we weren't allowed a light, you know, to shine. And everybody lined the streets with a candle. We all brushed out onto the street, and adults and children alike, and said, it's, 
the wars finished, the wars ended. And you kind of didn't know what to do. And we all looked for if we got any Union Jacks or flags. Yeah, they had all the flags out up all the streets. They had the tables and chairs out and the parties with all the kids and the mums and and, uh, waiting for the the dads coming home, you know. And uh, they had a really good day and they really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's a party in the street and tables, trestle tables and food and dancing and people next door, they allowed their piano to be shoved out into the street and somebody played it and, oh yes, it was great. Well, we all got together and we all went to the marketplace, Sub Square, and we were dancing around doing the okey cokey and all that, right, you know, and went around all the various pubs and dance halls and we, and we made merry until the early hour of the morning. Unfortunately, this is the only known film of the VE Day celebrations in Old Market Square. Over 20,000 people crowded into Slab Square that day to celebrate the victory over Europe. Well, there were hundreds thousands more like the whole market square was absolutely full teeming teeming fireworks yes. going all Climbing over the up place the lamp post. yes they get yes. a good view yes and yes. you know fireworks going everywhere lord mayor francis carney had this to say to the assembled masses this is a precious moment in the life of every person assembled here outstanding during the past six years is the meritorious work of Nottingham in the war effort. Tens of thousands of its men and women have joined the forces and with honour and loyalty have rendered service and duty to their native land. All honour to these brave ones who have perilled all in the time of their country's need. We pay testimony and give praise to the Home Guard, Civil Defence, Nottingham Police, the Red Cross and St John's, Services Comforts Fund, women's organisations, and all those who held authoritative and administrative positions in the effort of industry for the pursuit of the war. Indeed, every person who's worked loyally and well in any labour for the country's welfare, we warmly commend today. You now reap and can enjoy the fruits of all your precious toil. After we'd been down there and heard the declaration that the, um, you know, war was over and that, we actually went to the news theatre on Parliament Street, the three of us, and actually went to watch the, um, the concentration camp films because they'd just started bringing the concentration films and that, I think, was not a very pleasant experience. As, as a child, you had no concept of the terrible suffering, or even the fear. It was always a challenge to me. Some people would perhaps find it depressing, but it wasn't. There were a lot of good things happened. I, I got my opportunity to nurse, which I never would have had. It, 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 wherever you went... Everybody out one another. Everybody from one thing to another. The. Um, the camaraderie and the doing things for other people was acute. I mean, you you just banded together in a wonderful unit of looking out for other people and helping other people and calling on the elderly and fetching things for people. I, I've not known a feeling like that since. Let's face it, it was only victory over Europe. It wasn't victory over Japan. You'd still got fathers, sons, brothers, fighting for that cause as well, you see. Everybody was in a state of euphoria, really. They, uh, uh, they were uh, on a high because we'd had six years of it. And it's a long time, really. And, and you, you think things are going to be wonderful, but things don't work like that. I mean, people were coming back to jobs and uh, uh, people who had been in positions temporarily, of course, were reduced to back to where they were again. I did go back to Boots and I found it uh, rather mundane and uh, not, not active enough. Some of, the, some of the men couldn't settle. I mean, some of the men had been Japanese prisoners of war and they were in a terrible state, both health and mentally. And they were truculent and awkward to deal with, you know, they couldn't help it. Mm-hmm. And some of the men that had been badly wounded weren't very clever either. One, one of the... Uh 
neighbours just around the corner on James Street had been a Japanese prisoner of war and he returned home obviously at the very end of the war and he uh, he really was a matchstick man he would have had he stood upright he would have been well over six feet tall but he walked with a terrible stoop and his clothing flapped like some cartoon character and he was my mother used to say to me if we saw him on the street when I was going to the shops with my mother mother would say don't look but child like you did and uh, Sorry. It's okay. It's all right. Okay, so do you want us to stop? The, 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 um... <laughs> we'll stop for no. a couple of minutes. He had no, no, it was the... It was the absolute terror on his face. <coughs> and yet, he'd nothing to be afraid of. He'd come home. Let us not forget the men and women of Nottingham who sacrificed their lives for king and country in the name of freedom.